Well, hello again, everybody. Thank you for joining us today, part of the Go Global webinar series. Today's webinar, Selling Online with Localized Websites and VAT in Europe. It is time to get started. So to get us started, I'm going to ask for a bit of a sound Five, crunch here. Four, three, two, one. Right. Now, with that, I think that we can say that we're off. Thank you for joining us. I can see everybody on the screen here, attendees. We have attendees from across the United States and Europe. So wherever you are, thank you for joining us, whether it is the morning, midday, or even in the evening. You are very welcome. Um, my name is John Worthington. I am the CEO here at IBT Online. It is my pleasure today to introduce today's webinar, Selling Online with Localized Websites and VAT in Europe and introduce Susanna Hardy, our Director of Client Services, and Britta Eriksson, CEO of Euro VAT Refund Inc. Um, it is a great program that we have lined up for you today um, and we are presenting on the subject, I repeat, of European value-added tax and e-commerce. It is a great subject, specifically interesting at the moment as the macro GDP numbers coming out of Europe are going up, consumer and buyer indexes show increasing confidence, and so it is good that we're focusing on this specific subject, how you can best serve and best benefit out of this continuing European growth. Um, it's a very um, educational webinar that has been prepared for you, as Susanna and Britta and their respective teams have been hard at work. Um, they've collated a lot of very interesting, pertinent information for you, and there are many practical takeaways as well. So all of this has got a single objective to help you sell online in Europe while, of course, managing the related regulatory VAT environment. Um, before we kick off, um, one or two words on housekeeping. Um, so again, do know that this is one of a series. Um, we call it our Go Global webinar series, all of it of which is to help you grow your sales, your brands, and your businesses globally. The Go Global webinar series is over three years old now, and so there is a rich catalog of recorded webinars available to you on demand. Um, and you can find this at www.ibt.onl backslash resources. Um, and of course, going forward, um, there are webinars. There's a series of webinars. We run at a rate of two webinars per month, all of which to help you globalize your business. This webinar is approximately 45 minutes long. I will do this introduction, and then I will be handing over to Susanna on your screen on the left, and Britta on the screen on your right. There will be four polls, so we ask you to be active and participate with us in today's webinar. And of course, please, questions on your screen there. You see the question box, third from the bottom on the right. Um, open it up, submit your questions, and we'll be answering them. There is a chat box if you'd wish to. Don't hesitate to chat away. Um, and at the end of this webinar, there will be a brief survey. We'd ask you to just give us a small amount of feedback so that we can do a better job going forward. And finally, um, to help you relax and enjoy this webinar, just sit back knowing that on Friday, you're going to get an email inbound with a link to this webinar, this recorded webinar. So again, you can enjoy it um, at your leisure and convenience going forward. So sit back and enjoy um, today's webinar on selling online with localized websites and VAT in Europe. So it is my pleasure to um, introduce Susanna. Susanna is IBT Online's Director of Services. Susanna heads up our global operations, focusing on helping companies using the internet, and that's all about IBT Online's global range of services, using the web to do your business globally. If Susanna sounds a bit American when she presents later on, well, that's uh, not surprising. Susanna was uh, educated and has worked in the US over in New York, um, but as well has worked in, in Europe and Brussels and in London. Uh, Susanna brings us a huge expertise in international business development and online and has worked with a spectrum of companies, um, helping them effectively um, do business globally. Uh, two words on Britta. 
Martin Britta co-founded um, Euro VAT Refund back in 1992. So with over 25 years of experience on this subject, uh, Britta is the company's president and CEO since the start. And if you think that Britta sounds uh, Scandinavian, well, you wouldn't be far wrong, as her name suggests. Britta is, is Swedish in origin um, and is a leading U.S. financial services consultant in terms of the VAT programs and assists many, many North American and European companies in their VAT programs. Uh, Britta is an acknowledged expert on value-added tax issues, and it is frequently um, quoted and publicized in various magazines and journals, Consumer Reports, Wall Street Journal, and various academies. So today, please do know you have two experts who are going to be sharing um, all of the information with you so that we can do a great job uh, with localized websites and VAT in Europe. Uh, just w a few words on IBT Online. IBT Online is a company. Um, IBT Online, it's a private U.S. and European company. IBT stands for International Business and Technologies. Um, we've been in business since 2002, so 15 years in helping companies go online with website localization and international online marketing services. We focus on helping companies grow their top line, their sales, their brands, and their businesses globally. Um, we run the clients, our clients' online presence uh, through specific, what we call country-specific websites. Now, talking about today, so specifically, we'll be talking about Germany, German sites for the German market, so that's e-commerce in Germany, French e-commerce, UK e-commerce, um, Italian and Spanish. So these are bespoke e-commerce functionality in as a result and the regulatory environment requirements being met. And we call that our online global program. Now, without any more ado, um, I'm going to ask Susanna, Susanna um, if you are there, please, uh, can I hand to you? Thank you very much, John. Uh, this is great. Um, I'm just going to put up here the, the table of contents and just get right started. As you can see, we're just going to set the scene a little bit and then hand to Britta to talk about how VAT, VAT works um, uh, across Europe um, uh, and, and some samples. And then as a U.S. company, what you would be looking at in that sense, and in particularly with regards to e-commerce. And then I'm going to show you some examples at the end uh, of, of localized websites and how they function in terms of e-commerce. Um, and as John said, he does have, uh, we do have some time at the end for our, our questions. So getting right stuck in there, um, I wanted to um, share this very first slide with you. Um, there's a lot on the slide, sorry about that, but it's, 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 um, it's actually taken some, some um, screen grabs taken from a report done about a year ago from McKinsey, um, who were really interested in figuring out where you know, what about international trade and what it's looking like at the moment. And basically they're, they're arguing that, you know, international trade used to be all about just physical goods and services, but in today's digital world, it's all moving online. Um, as they point out, these now exert a bigger influence on GDP than physical goods. Now this is, it just underlines the point about the need to have a strong online presence in today's business world. It's remarkable to remember that you know, 15 years ago, online didn't really didn't really happen. wasn't really there. Um, and today, you know, it, I think most people would agree that sort of e-commerce is where the future of a lot of trade will be playing out. Um, you know, conventional trade and trade routes are rather in decline. So uh, the the e-commerce together with localized websites becomes really uh, absolutely uh, um, key for um, any kind of company that's looking at exporting. Um, by the way, you'll note that the biggest single flow, the biggest sort of line arrow, uh, either in terms of data communication or even in terms of the hardware like cables, are between Europe and the United States. Uh, but overall, they're still looking to grow by a factor of nine over the next couple of years. So leading on, I just want to show you a little bit what some of the you know big, big companies are doing. You know, they're all getting on board with this. Um, I think out of the top 100 companies in terms of size, 99 of them have uh, not just localized websites, so you know, websites for each country, but also you know, Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, active social medias in each country. Um, you know, this, is a, this is a vast 
uh, investment needed. But it's our view that 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 um, that today's technology allows allows all companies to do this. And this is just a, an example of what Coca-Cola does in terms of its different markets. Um, underneath is is Brazil, and up on the top is is India. Um, and here we have again what what smaller mid-sized companies. I mean, we're not all the with the budgets of, of Coca-Cola, but our point and we our our, our where we focus is really on the mid-cap companies. Um, and our view and our mission really is convinced that the online world allows mid-caps to punch above their weight, to use the same platforms as really large companies, to get their brand out there in the global world, and uh, to reach across borders and really impact uh, their 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 development, their business development, and grow their sales and, and brand and businesses uh, uh, globally. So that's that's sort of where we're coming from on that. And uh, again, as I said, there's a lot on these slides, but you do have a, a copy of the um, of the slide deck coming your way. So for us, this is just to say we're very committed on the online field and using online tools for um, uh, small, medium-sized enterprises. We think that the, by using them, you can really get a huge leg up and a ladder up into the uh, into the global exporting world um, and uh, through localized websites. So this is just uh, another slide here about e uh, the retail e-commerce index. Um, there's, there's a huge amount of information on uh, e-commerce in the world, uh, and it's measured e-commerce, m-commerce, and cross-border. Those are the three major things. We'll talk about that in a moment. I just really want to highlight this table because if I look at it from a European point of view, you know, four out of the top ten markets uh, in the world are in Europe. Um, you know, you you they're 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 very large. They're not just you know significant. They're they're really growing fast and and uh, have have very strong growth rates. All of them in double digit growth rates, um, and worth and worth looking at in that sense. So again, let's just say you know how important Europe is on the side. Finally, just the big big trends. And again, we have another webinar just on this on this uh, subject. Some of the very big trends we see in e-commerce and localized websites. I guess they're really sort of, uh, uh, you know, four big, big trends that we're seeing. One is obviously video uh, and, you know, short clips, short video. People prefer to see something rather than having to read it. Um, this is uh, sometimes tricky in markets. Not all markets accept YouTube. Some markets accept other things. So you have to be quite careful of that. The second point is mobile and that you have to be accessible on every type of platform possible, whether it's a a tablet or a smartphone, uh, you know, a lot of markets, emerging markets, and even now European markets are more mobile than uh, fixed PCs these days. The next one is cross-border sales and anything from, you know, Canada, a Canadian company buying something in the U.S., that's a cross-border. Um, a Dutch company buying something in Germany, that's cross-border. Um, German consumers taking advantage of a lower pound in the UK, that's cross-border. These are growing across the world, certainly at double the rate of the e-commerce growth rates. So they're growing, on the whole, average of about 30-40% per annum. So it's huge. And then the last trend I wanted to point out, again, which is just a reiteration, is these globalized, global localized websites. So these websites that are anchored into local markets. And I'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, John, if you like, we can have a first poll. Good idea. OK, let's jump on it. So here we go. I am going to launch the first poll. And here we go. So please, everybody, grab your mice, get ready to click. And here we go. Do you export to Europe? Please, everybody out there in the US and across Europe, do you export to Europe? Is it yes with market partners? Are you, are you already onto e-commerce? Have you got a mix of both? Are you thinking about it? Or is it no? Um, let me give you a little bit of feedback. 
Um, 50% are saying yes within market partners. 23% are saying it's a mix of e-commerce and in-market partners. 12% uh, are saying no, they're not on it yet. So that's very interesting. We'll keep this information recorded. You'll receive this on Friday, this feedback for these polls. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to close this poll by trying to see, can I get this to go? How about a uh, horn? Here we go. There you go. That's it closed. Thank you very much indeed. Susanna, back to you. Thank you very much, John. Thanks. That was great. That's, that's it. Those are interesting numbers, in fact. A lot of you are relying on in-market partners as well as e-commerce. And we'll be talking about that for, for VAT. So now, um, just wanted to pass over to Britta and talk a bit about how VAT works. Uh, Britta? Thank you, Susanna. Uh, and thank you everyone for listening in and I do understand fully that some of you are in the United States so you are not familiar with the, how value added tax works and some of you are from Europe so you of course already know how VAT works to a big extent but I think also from Europe you might uh, find some of this beneficial for you as well because it does affect you if you put warehouses in other countries than yourself when it comes to e-commerce. So uh, then, as uh, of course, we have the, all these wonderful new markets where we can all ship around the world, globe, and sell directly, and of course, then taxes goes in, and it's a little bit of a hinder, for sure, uh, and the value of taxes touches as well, but if you, the first advice I want to give you here is that make sure that before you start to sell to any country whatsoever, please do your homework in how customs and VAT works. That is really important no matter what country you sell to. Uh, and also just initially I would say that uh, value added taxes are going to tell you is actually an implemented tax almost in every country in the world except the United States and a few other exceptions. Um, the advantage with the European countries is that there you can actually handle the VAT without being registered as a company there. You do not have to be established. But that is not the case in most other countries in the world. If you do warehouse products in those other countries, maybe, for example, in South America or in China or Asia or somewhere, you do need to have an establishment as well. But in the European Union, in Europe, it is often possible to um, do trade and just um, think about the VAT, so that is a great advantage. So how does the VAT work? Well, here I want to compare with the sales tax in the United States. You guys from U.S., you probably know how the sales tax works in U.S. It is usually only assessed on products, not on services, first of all. And also the principle is that you will only charge sales tax when you sell to an end user directly. For example, if you sell to a private person or if you sell to a company where they will use your products. Uh, otherwise, in the U.S., you have a resell uh, tax certificate that you can provide if you're going to resell your products. Uh, also in U.S., when a company has to pay for sale tax for something that you use, for example, your office furniture, it's not deductible to you, so it ends up at a cost. So that's the basic for a uh, sale tax. The value added tax that is implemented in almost every country in the world does not work like that. Um, the, the principle of the VAT is that if you sell within your own country, you do charge that to absolutely everyone. It doesn't matter who you sell to. You can sell to a private person, hospital, company. They can use it for resell or not. It doesn't matter. You charge that to everyone. You also charge it on all products and also all services. There are a few exceptions, but basically that is all covered. So if you sell um, e-commerce products, if you sell um, refrigerators, if you are a lawyer and you sell law services, if you're an accountant, or you do marketing, you always charge that. And also, the European company, they will pay that on everything that they um, purchase. So when they, during the month, get in um, invoices for product for resell, product that they will keep themselves, the lawyer sends them uh, invoices, the accountant sends them invoices, the consultants, the travel, they all charge that. So the basic for these companies in these, all these VAT countries is that they charge that on everything, and they also pay that on everything that they buy. And then at the end of the month, they do a VAT declaration, a VAT return to the tax authorities. For example, a company in the United Kingdom, they will do a, a VAT return to the UK tax authorities, and there they declare 
how much of that they have collected from their customers. And against that, they can deduct almost all the VAT that they have paid to the vendors. And then they pay in the difference to the tax authorities. So for them, for all these companies in the uh, VAT countries around the world, um, the principle is that they pay in VAT on the value that they add. But a very, very uh, good bottom line is that the VAT for them should never, ever, ever, ever end up as a cost. A company should never end up with VAT as a cost at the end of the day. Only the private person, the private customer that comes in mostly, will have it end up as a, a cost at the end of the day. So when you are from US trading in all these countries, you should have in your mind that the VAT here is an issue. There is a 20% VAT around the world. Um, it should never end up as a cost to you as a company, never ever. But to get to that point, you have to plan ahead and you have to learn how this works before you start to trade internationally. Next, please. So as I said, implemented tax all over the world call different things. Australia, for example, and also Canada, they call it GST, 10%. China call it that, they have 17%. France, 20%. Germany, 19%. Japan, 8 and so on and so forth. So you can say that around the world, it is pretty common to be 20%. Asia can be a little bit less, and a few other countries. Uh, the Euro Europe, European countries are usually around 20%. It can be as low as 17, and it can be as high as 27% in Hungary. So that's a lot of money. So again, learn how this works so it doesn't end up as a cost to you as a company before you start to trade. You have to plan ahead of time. Next. So then that in the European Union and Europe and other countries. What is the difference? Well, as I kind of mentioned is that the VAT incurred in the European Union, that's about 20%, can often be reclaimed. So it really doesn't end up as a cost to the American company, even though you don't have an establishment, a company, a subsidiary in Europe. Um, this is usually not the case for other countries. Um, Australia works pretty much the same thing. Canada, too, if you set it up correctly. But do be uh, careful if you trade to, for example, South America, Asia, Africa, and so forth, because there, if you are required to import and store your products there, it usually requires you to have an establishment there. But not in the EU, not Australia, and a few other countries is not the case. But again, do plan ahead. Next. So the uh, European Union, what is that? Well, this, here's a map of Europe. And uh, the blue countries now are within the European Union. And you see to the left, DB, that is the United Kingdom. As, and as you know, they have decided to exit uh, the European Union uh, in, in a few years here. And, but at this point, they are in the EU, and they have the same rules as the EU countries. We do not know what the changes is going to be, not in VAT either, like most of the other parts. But we are sure that UK will still have that value added tax. How that is going to connect into the EU countries, we do not know. But we will, of course, keep you updated and provide new webinars when we know how this is going to work. But for now, if you look at this map, particularly you guys from US, you can think about the European Union countries here in blue as the United States when it comes to trade. Um, they are. Um, um, they are, it's a connected system. So if you ship a product into the European Union, for example, from China or US, you import into one country, and this is where you clear customs, and this is where you pay the duty. But also, do note that when you import, in addition to the duty, VAT is also due to the local customs. So for example, when you ship in products for e-commerce, you can uh, ship it into the United Kingdom, Ireland, Germany, Holland. And when you ship the first country, they would clear customs into the European Union. So you can compare that to shipping into the United States. You will ship to the US, you clear customs, import into the United States, for example, through Los Angeles or Atlanta. The goods are now in the United States for trade, and you can ship it around and sell in the United States, and you don't have to worry about any customs anymore but you do have to worry about the American sale tax uh, laws in the different states. So the same thing goes for the European Union. Uh, you import into one country, 
there you pay the import duty and also VAT. Now it is for a trade within the European Union countries. You can ship it around, but now you have to think about the VAT rules in these countries. So it's very much like the United States. Um, the VAT rules in the EU countries pretty much work the same. They are decided by the European Union, and the countries have to follow those laws to about 80-85%, but they also are free to implement uh, their own local rules a little bit uh, differently uh, on a certain percent, and they actually do that too, so it can work a little bit differently. But the principle for VAT here is that, for example, if you ship in e-commerce products to Amazon in UK, it is very common that an American company starts to ship in and they put it in the full fulfillment warehouse of Amazon in the United Kingdom called GB here. Then you have to be registered for that in the United Kingdom. Again, you do not have to an establishment there, no subsidiary, but you have to register for that. That is usually possible as long as all you do is ship around products and you don't have any employees and so forth then you do need to charge that that I'm going to show you when you ship around the products. And the good thing here is that if you warehouse in UK, you can actually be on the Amazon website in UK, Germany, and so on and so forth. What drives the VAT registration is where do you have the warehouse. In every country in the Europe where you put products in a warehouse to sell on, you have to be registered for that in that country. So therefore, it is a pretty good general advice when you start up to warehouse in Europe, pick one country, pick a VAT-friendly country, which is mostly the western part of the EU, start there, and then as you grow, then you can start to also uh, ship in products to other warehouses as well. And lately, lastly about this map, do you note know that not all countries in Europe belong to the EU. For example, there's a little country um, in gray next to France, that is Switzerland. And up next, uh, left of Sweden, there is Norway. They do not belong to the EU. However, they have that. The rules follow very much the EU countries, but it's not a connected system. The countries in EU, as we said, they have the same rule, and they also compare notes. So, for example, when a French company sells to a German company, they both have to report this transaction in the local tax return, and then the German and the French tax authorities often do comparison. They do cross-check and see that uh, everything has been reported. So they very much work together, the tax authorities, and uh, make sure that everything has been reported and there was a cross-reference between the countries. Next. Peter, could we have a uh, another poll here, please? Yeah. Yeah, is that okay? Okay. With that's fine. Then that's, that means me. I'm jumping in here. And this one is going to be, if everybody, if you are ready, please, um, how comfortable are you feeling? How compliant are you feeling? There you go. It's your chance to tell us. So, um, yes, I'm fully compliant and I'm up to date. Yes, but not in all of our European markets. Not sure and no. How are you feeling? Um, let me tell you, 35% uh, are saying that they're on it, uh, fully compliant, 59, 60% are not sure, and um, of, of some 14% are saying uh, not in all markets. That's very interesting. Well, there you go. There are things to be done. So here you go. With that little um, dance hall horn, I'm closing down the second um, poll, and I'm saying back to you, Britta, and thank you. Thank you, John. Yes, I, I assume that uh, the companies from Europe are fully compliant here, more or less, and the other not so much. That is my wild guess here, so thank you. Anyway, now when we're going to go into VAT, and we're focusing on the European Union now, Europe, and e-commerce, so to speak. So that can be sales of digital service, as Susanna just mentioned. That is when you sell in uh, online games, music, software, cloud, all services that can be downloaded digital uh, from your customers, and also can be shipment of actual goods. And that is then when you sell in from your own e-commerce site in, in the US, for example, or you use Amazon or eBay or something like that. That's the difference. Uh, so then uh, that registration, as I said, is required. And again, the advantage with Europe here is that as long as this is all you do, you do not have any employees there or offices or some other things, usually then you can register for that only. You don't have to have another establishment. 
but do check on this also when you start on, but that's kind of the general rule. So digital services, when you sell that into private person, um, I'm going to show that actually on the next slide. I just want to say that also when you have that registration might be required in Europe if you organize a conference and trade show, for example, a user conference or something like that, then you also need to register for that. Next slide. So that on online services, digital services. So this is again when you sell something that your customer can download from you. So they, you have a, a you are in the US, you sell something online, and customers all over the world can download this from you. So then how it works in Europe and more and more, more other countries as well is going to start with this. The EU then, they um, say that if you sell business to business, B2B, then general, you don't have to worry about the VAT. You can just sell, and uh, the European customer will take care of the VAT part. So there is no VAT issue there. But when you sell B2C, business to customer, then generally you have to register for that in one of the EU countries, and you have to start to charge VAT to the private people in Europe. So that would mean that, for example, you do have where people can download and they are private people, then you do need to put in place to register for that. For example, in UK is a good country right now, at least until they exit and then maybe Ireland or Holland, and you uh, register for that there, and then you have to start to charge that. You have to uh, set up your website so you can see when do you have a business buying from you and when is it a private person. That needs to be proved on your website, and how you do that is if, if you sell to business, you have to ask for the VAT number. If you sell to a private person, you need to have backups such as their uh, credit card or IP number or uh, phone code where they are from to see that that's really true, and then you do need to charge that to them. For example, if you sell to a customer in Sweden, you have to charge 25% VAT, a customer in Germany, 19%. So that's how it works. But the thing is with B2C, what does that really mean? Because we have, of course, all these app stores uh, all over, or you sell through Facebook or Google or some kind of app store, and all your customers are private, and you really are selling to them directly, however you do it through an app store. What is that? Is that B2C or is it B2B? That actually, if you have that situation that you sell through an app store, whatever that might be, then you don't have to register either. That app store uh, or reseller, so to speak, is supposed to take care of that part, which means that they register for that and they will charge that to your customer and they declare it. So that means that if you are selling a digital service from US, for example, a game to a kid in Stockholm, Sweden, through an app store, then what happened is that you sell it maybe for $50 or you pay, uh, of course, some of them are, of course, free too, but if you sell them and you charge something for it, whatever they have to buy from you, then what happened is that they will actually pay 25% of that also to the app store, but that is something that you don't really see. But if you are selling directly to them, you are supposed to ready to that. And this is a very, very tricky part because it's sometimes very hard to tell how you really sell. You know, what is the chain there really? So therefore, if you do sell digital services, we really advise you to check on what, what the rules is for you. And do note that many, I would say most companies outside the EU that are selling in digital services, B2C really clearly, they have not complied. They have not registered for that. They do not do this. And, and it's a big, big problem for the EU to try to catch all these guys that do this outside the European Union because they know there are so many doing this. And most of these companies outside Europe, they are not aware. It's not that they're trying to break the law. They simply are not aware that this is a requirement. Many of these companies are very small. They just open up. And as you know, the whole world is their market immediately. So they are so small, they hardly have a tax department, no international tax department, they simply do not know. But they run into a big, big problem because, first of all, the tax authorities in Europe is trying to go after them now. So we know that, for example, Germany has started to contact companies in US and so forth and told them that they are selling into private people in, in Germany and they require them to pay in a lot of that. So then these US companies have to fight that legally, which is very complicated and costly. 
And also, you know, you have to ask yourself if you start a company, do you want to stay legal and comply or not? You know, you can start and not do that. Maybe you're not going to get caught. But do keep in mind that if you ever want to sell your company or go public, you know, you become very successful, then if you have not complied with these rules, that is something that would come up at that point, and it's a major liability to you. So we have companies contacted us, Eurobat, who have been doing this for some years, and it turns out that they owe a lot of that to the European countries, and that is a huge problem when they try to sell over public eventually. So please, when you have this situation, do check on it, uh, what, what is applied for you, and are you absolutely sure that you do not have to register, or is there a chance you have to register? Um, next one. No, you can skip this. I just, oh, no, no, sorry, sorry, no, sorry. Uh, that on e-commerce, now we're talking about goods. So when you sell from the U.S., for example, Ian, you, have, you can sell from your own warehouse in the U.S. into Europe. And that, of course, means that you have a website uh, and you got a customer from England, for example, places an order. You, at that point, ship it up from the U.S. Uh, warehouse and you ship it directly to that customer. In those cases, you do not have to register for that in Europe because you're not warehousing anything there, uh, and your customer really is liable for the input VAT and duty. But do be aware when you have that situation that uh, if you ship, your customer is liable for paying the 20% VAT and the duty, so that will add about 30% to the cost. So you need to make sure that that works from the distance point of view. Maybe you want to pay it to the freight forwarder, for example, UPS on their behalf, that is fine, you can do that, but then make sure that you add on 30% on the price to them, or you choose to have the customer in Europe being the importer, that means that you ship it in by mail, they get a phone call from the mail office, they have to go there and pay the duty in that in order to get the product. So that is something that you have to understand how that works. That goes if you ship to any country around the world and understand and communicate that very well to your customers so they clearly are aware that when they place an order to you for $100, it will cost them 30% more eventually, and how is that going to cost going to be? So that needs to be very, very clear on the website that you have. Then you have the other situation where you store in Europe. You ship in goods, store in Europe, and then you sell it on. Typical now is Amazon, for example. So this means you decide to contract with Amazon in Europe, you ship in products to store in their UK fulfillment warehouse, for example, and then you go on their website and you sell on to Europe. That, again, requires you to register for that in the United Kingdom. When you import, you have to make sure that the importer or record is recorded as you, your company, and your VAT number, because that will be assessed upon import, and I will show you that too. Then you have to charge VAT on the sale, so that means when you put the prices on the website in Europe, that has to be included. So that means, for example, if you want $100 per product, you have to state 120 because that's what the customer will pay. And then you declare this to the tax authorities. So this is the legal compliance. Also, Amazon will not take you on until you have this registration in place. And also, it will ultimately save you money because the VAT will not end up as a cost to you. Next slide. So again, products shipped to the UK or any country with VAT in the world, Argentina, Chile, China, Germany, this is how it works. You ship it over there. For example, you have a commercial invoice of 100000 that goes with the shipment. Duty will be assessed by the local customs, as we all know. We all expect that to happen. Then they have a subtotal in this sample of 103000 um, that will also actually uh, add in a few other items. Then the local custom will add on the VAT. So in UK, this means 20%. So in addition to paying this 3,000 to the local UK customs, you also have to pay, in this case, 20,000 in VAT. So that is what American companies are very surprised about. They are not aware. They expect the duty, but they are very not aware of that. So therefore, that's what I'm again saying that this, that should be refundable to you, but you have to make sure that you know about this ahead, you set it up correctly from the start, and you register for that when you need to. Next. So for example, then if you go on the Amazon website, as I said, you want to have $100 for a product, 
you need to state on the website 120 because when you sell to customers, private people in Europe, the prices are always stated including that. You know how it works in the US, if you go and shop in a store, for example, you buy something, the sales tax is always added on when you check out. It is never listed on the price. That is not the case in Europe. If you sell to any private people, prices are stating including that. And Amazon absolutely requires this. So when you go in and put your price on the Amazon website, make sure that the VAT is included also because the customer will pay you 120 in this case. You need to send 20 to the UK tax authorities and 100 is yours. So that's very important to keep in mind. Next. Uh, next. And here's a sample of uh, the VAT declaration then to go into, again, so I want to show you that that will not add up to anything. Don't you have one more here? I think the, yeah, exactly, thank you. Uh, so, for example, in this case, you sell to Amazon, so you have a lot of orders. So in the month, you collect 40,200 VAT from your customers all over Europe on the Amazon. And then against that, you can deduct all the VAT that you have paid out. And that is mostly the input VAT. Remember now, when you ship it into the UK, you had to pay customs. That is a cost to you. You also had to pay a lot of VAT that you can claim back. So you then um, pay in the VAT that is due to the tax authorities. And against it, you deduct your VAT that you have incurred. And you pay in the difference to the tax authorities. So again, this means for you, the VAT is never a cost. Um, next. I think it's time for another poll. Um, if that's yes, exactly. uh, good, you a poll. Okay, yeah. it's me again. Absolutely. Here we go. Here is the third one. So I'm about to launch this one directly. So please, everybody, up you come. Here we go. What is your biggest European VAT challenge? There you go. Um, Britt has been outlining some of the um, details there, which um, I'm sure that uh, those of you who are um, performing already understand and others are getting to learn. So let me say 20% uh, are saying it's keeping informed and updated. 70% uh, of clear majority there, 70% are saying it's about gathering all that information. 16% um, is saying actually filing the documentation and some 10% is saying actually payment. That's very interesting. Thank you for your mm -hmm. feedback. Here we go. That is the closing out of the third poll, so I'm shutting it down and I'm handing it back to uh, Britta. I think that this one will be yours then. Um, yeah, and this was my last slide here, so I thank you very much for listening in. And again, I know that you guys in UK clearly know this. However, you, of course, have to register. If you put uh, a warehouse in Germany, for example, all of a sudden, or in Spain or somewhere, you do need to register for that in those countries as well. That's how it works for you. Uh, so in that regard, they work the same for you here. So thank you so much for listening in, and uh, we're happy to answer questions at the end of the session here too. Thank you very much, Britta. And in fact, I've just looked, we do actually already have some, uh, some questions coming in. So, so uh, I think we'll have some, I'll go quickly through mine, leave some question time for the end. Um, I just wanted to sort of summarize a little bit in terms of e-commerce choices, what we see happening. And, and Britta's given you an example of what we would call an, an online mall. That's like an Amazon or, you know, um, in China, so Alibaba, Rakuten in Japan. Um, this sort of thing. A lot of our clients as well uh, sell via their distributors' platforms, uh, and these these have some some clear advantages. There's there's a lot a lot of work for you to do. It's very easy, um, uh, but there's some major disadvantages, which is the most important of which is that it's your distributor who owns your brand, and uh, your business development depends on your distrib distributor, not you. Um, so I just wanted to say in terms of our e-commerce. Uh, experience with, with clients, what we find that works best and what as you know ticks all their boxes in terms of of, of, of of strong growth, owning and developing brands and businesses online and, and globally is to have your own specific website localized for markets, which you then add e-commerce ability. So that's the kind of thing that I'm going to show you here. Uh, sort of a, a, a case in point. Um, these are, uh, you know, the, the top one, for example, your dental depot. This is a company who has basically created their own e-commerce platform. Um, uh, and the, the one in the bottom um, 
uh, has a series of uh, different ways to to routes to market. But in each case, I mean, they can sell via distributor, via an online mall. Um, but in each case, they own their own dis own websites in these markets, so that even if you're selling on an Amazon platform, you can still have your own localized website, which will allow you to make sure that your brand is yours and is growing and developing not to Amazon's benefit, but to your benefit. Um, and I'll give you some examples again. Um, here, just an example of companies that are producing a, 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 a strong localized website. In this case, it wasn't actually for Europe, it was for China, but, um, you know, who had distributors and in-market partners and therefore gave them the tool to work with, gave them a, a localized, strong uh, local website, uh, which the, in this case, Chinese in-market partners were therefore able to use to sell and to, to, to further the business. Um, this next one, again, in terms of generating leads for uh, distributors or directly back into your own company. Um, and again, it's about having um, uh, you know, dedicated websites for your target export markets, which then allow you to generate leads, um, uh, which you either then pass on directly to distributors or um, reply directly and ship from your core market, either the U.S. Or, or the U.K. or wherever it is you're doing that from. And the key then is to use those platforms of localized websites as a platform to build, build the sales and, and grow your brand. And a final one here, again, this is a company that does a lot of e-commerce, uh, particularly B2B um, uh, and, and some B2Government, but um, mainly B2B. And again, uh, like a lot of our clients, like a lot of the custom, uh, uh, companies we work with, they have a slight sort of, you know, David and what I call David and Goliath uh, relationship to some of their, their, their um, customers. They are perhaps more niche, more focused, uh, and are serving very large customers. In that case, their, their brand really has to be, it's, it's really key for them. It really has to be absolutely faultless. Um, and they really felt that they could not rely on their in-market partners, their distributors, who might be having other companies on the same web page as their products, um, and might not have their brands as the foremost you know, priority. So they took back control of their brands, developed localized websites, and and really pushed forward in terms of of, of their of their exports and growth. So again, um, uh, the localized website helping them to to nurture their brand on that. And I guess that's uh, I'm gonna as I said I'm gonna rush through some of these because we don't have uh, that much time. I just want to leave you with this. <laughs> um, just sort of a, a summary of what is a localized website, and for us, it's, a, it's really a, a website that you customize um, and make good in your target export market, so that your target export export uh, um, potential clients really understand your website and and um, relate to that website, so that the the imagery is right, the the the, the optimization is correct, um, so it's optimized for local search engines, not just your domestic one. So there you go, this is a Woody Allen telling us uh, just to sort of show up and be there, be in the local market, uh, not just staying at home to sell internationally. And that sort of concludes sort of well, some of the things that I want to say. John, if we have a last poll, that'd be great. Yes, indeed. And here we go. I like that. Susanna reaching out to Woody Allen from New York. There you go. New York to New Yorker on that. Um, I guess it means showing up. And so, therefore, this is quite relevant to this uh, particular poll. Here we go. Please, um, related to that point, how online are you in Europe? Um, how online, meaning do you have localized websites in Europe? Um, do you have a website for the Germans, a website for the French, website for the Italians, etc., so that they are directly, um, shall we say, localized? Now, the feedback is that 10% um, are saying yes, 10% are saying some, 25% are saying thinking about it, and some 60% are saying no. Um, well, there you go. That's very interesting feedback. Um, as you're developing your e-commerce into Europe, that's food for thought. With that, I'm going to close down our last poll. Here we go. It's closed, and um, I'm handing it back to Susanna. Or is it actually question time now? Well, I think I think we could, if we 
we can have a bit of a, a few a few minutes. So I've I've gone quite quickly to try and leave a little bit of time for uh, for questions. I just wanted to to remind people that we do have a lot of resources on our website as well. If you're interested in pursuing any of the topics uh, explored today, um, uh, if you go onto our website, you can look at other other webinars or or ebooks or blogs. Um, but I hope that we do have a bit of time also for questions, John. Yeah, we do. And um, I would jump straight in and say, look, first of all, um, Britta, Susanna, thank you very much indeed. Um, there are a lot of questions here. Um, we're not going to get to all of them. So do know, for example, CPC questions, we can see it here. We will get to that, um, um, but probably not today. Um, I'm just going to jump to the fir first one here. Britta, um, I hope you understand this. It says, I, um, I'm a U.S. manufacturing company. Okay, I get that. And they're selling a $1 million machine into uh, to a German company. So I guess that's a German legal entity. What trade terms, INCO terms, should they apply to this transaction? How does that work? Britta, can you help them out? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So that is a, a B2B, business-to-business -business, uh, sale then, I assume. And always when you sell from a U.S. or any country, uh, it is, uh, as a main principle, it's very good when you sell B2B, you sell products that make sure you don't have to import into the country. So that means that use any other input terms than BDP. BDP means duty uh, delivery paid, and that means that you put yourself in a position where you have to be the importer into the country, so you have to clear customs, pay the duty in that, and then sell on. That is not good. So use some other kind of income terms than DDP, and that will make sure that your, uh, you can certainly deliver door to door, but you make sure that your customer is responsible for clearing customs into the country, and they will pay the duty and also the VAT that is due. They are already registered for VAT in the country, so they will just claim that back easily. So in this case, the German company will clear customs, they will pay the duty, and they will pay the VAT to the German customs and they will go home and they claim that VAT back right away in their own VAT return because they already are ready for that. So that is a good principle when you ship in products B2B. It's different when you ship into customers in Europe, private people, because they are not set up for the import, they don't know what it means, that's a whole other matter. But surely when you ship B2B, do not use DDP. Brenna, thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that that gets um, help. And by the way, um, please, uh, we, you know, you, we can continue the dialogue about um, uh, this, those issues um, online and offline after this, this webinar. Susanna, a quick one. Um, this one says, um, I, I think it, it's a U.S.-based company again saying, I'm expanding into multiple markets in Europe. Um, how should I approach the localization process to minimize costs? Uh, do I need a website for each, each country? Well, Good luck, Susanna. Can you answer that? Uh, thank you very much, Sean. I think in an ideal world, we would say yes. You need a website for everybody. But uh, realistically, I think that's just not possible. Uh, you know, the, you know that, that's, that's a very, very large budget uh, and time resource. Um, our recommendation is to make sure you get your priorities. Either those are the markets that uh, are most important for you, or else, if they're all sort of equally important, just think about the biggest potential markets. And those tend to be the big three. So Germany, France, UK, and then following that, Spain, Italy. Um, with those three, the three big, you know, Germany, France, and UK, you've covered about <clears throat> over 60% over of European GDP. Um, and, 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 well, what is that, 80? Uh, 150 million people. So, you know, the, already those three should be enough um, as a priority. They also, I think it's also worth remembering how much the, the, those three countries have in terms of spheres of influence. If you just take Germany, for example, that's a, just in terms of population, that's 80 million, 82 million. If you add then German-speaking Switzerland, um, Austria, parts of the Czech Republic, parts of parts of Poland that understand and speak German well, parts of the Netherlands which speak German well, you're quickly getting up to about 100 million people just with a German website. So, uh, uh, and again, that's, it's, it's a, huge, a huge economy. So make sure you have your priorities when you're going at, at the whole of Europe because there's an awful lot of very small countries there as well. Um, uh, ideally though, yes, you should localize for each market, but given resources, 
you make your priorities, pick the biggest ones that you can for your targets. Thank you. Yeah, Susanna, that makes sense. And, and Britta, in, in a way, this is sort of the same thing. I like this question. That's why I was sort of jumping on this one. Somebody's asked, what is the best country in Europe to import through? Yeah, that is a good question. And you know what? Uh, we, um, I have to say Western Europe. So uh, United Kingdom, for example, is excellent. And uh, unfortunately, now they will uh, leave with the Brexit, so we don't know what that's going to mean. But so I have to leave it open for that. But also, Netherlands is also an excellent country to import through. Very, very good. Uh, then it comes, uh, from VAT point of view, for example, Ireland. But logistically, Ireland is not placed very good. Um, and uh, Germany comes in also. But the Western European countries, so stay, stay out of uh, Southern Europe and Eastern Europe. It's very hard to handle from a VAT point of view. It gets very costly, very complicated. Uh, so the Western European countries in general are a lot um, easier, less costly, and complicated than Southern and Eastern Europe. Yeah, Britta, thank you. Thank you. That, that does make sense. So, Susanna, a quick one here as we move towards the end. Um, Susanna, this one is about social media. Um, uh, social media online in Europe to promote products. Um, do I need it? Uh, yes, is the, is the answer. Um, uh, it's no good, you know, building a fabulous um, website which is, you know, fully translated, localized, optimized, has, uh, is really doing really well in that local market, and then you sort of let it sort of sit in the garage. You, you, you need to get it out there. You need to keep it alive and, and fresh and new and interesting and, and, and connect to your audience, whether that's B2B or B2C. You need to be able to connect, and these days that is through social media. And uh, what's interesting is that all, all big economies and some of the most of the small ones have their own social media platforms and norms and ways of going about things. But in every country, certainly in Europe, in every country, companies you know, are using social media uh, as their prime tool for communication uh, with their website these days. So if you have a website, you need to also make sure that you're using it, and social media is the way to do that. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. And, and Britta, I guess this has got to be the last of two questions, just a 20-second response here, please. But um, and a very important question I can see is, they're selling products online from their warehouse in the U.S. to customers around the world. Um, how do I handle the duty and VAT? Yeah, that's when, if you do that, you can do, that's a good way to do it. Then you, uh, you should make sure that your customer is the importer. However, uh, then you have to look how you ship. If you ship, for example, with DHL and UPS, they can clear customs on your behalf, and then they can send you the import and, and VAT duty, and you will pay that to the shipper. However, then you have to make sure that you tell the customer that in addition to the price, they have to pay the import VAT and duty, so you need to add on like 30% depending on the country. You can also choose to have your customer in Europe be the importer, but do keep in mind that most people, private people, are not happy about going to the mail office and have to pay duty and VAT when they get the package. It, it's not a good thing for them. So try to set it up so that you pay to the shipper and then you pass on the cost to the customer. Berta, thank you very much. Good response. Okay, well, um, I'm, I'm looking at the time, and so I'm very wary in saying thank you very much. I think that we have to... Um, call a close here and just say to you, um, uh, I see the other questions about um, uh, why is it only a VAT to the end customer. We will get back to you on these questions. We will get back to you on CPC. We will get back to you on all of those other questions. So please do uh, just watch your email box. Um, we will be responding. It's my time now to say thank you to everyone for participating today. We hope that you've enjoyed the webinar. We hope that you have found a lot of useful information, lots of takeaways to help you grow your exports and your business internationally. Um, a closing factoid um, related to what Britta was saying, um, a very interesting sort of factoid. Um, European VAT is estimated at 1,143 billion euros. So that's what they're collecting. Uh, that's an awful lot of money. It's certainly not small change. It's very important um, for the, um, uh, shall we say, programs and the expenditure programs of European governments. And getting back to Britta's point, there is something called the VAT gap 
What is the VAT gap? It is that famous uncollected tax. Um, it is estimated at 14%, some 160 billion, which is actually what the European VAT authorities are looking for. So as Britta was saying, beware, do be vigilant because the European tax authorities are looking for the VAT gap. They know it's there and there is an estimated 160 billion of euros unclaimed, uh, un ungathered, which they're after. So, uh, please um, do be aware there's a questionnaire coming up now, the survey. Um, so as we close it down, first of all and finally then in the closing, I would just like to say thank you very much indeed. This is for Susanna, this is for Britta. Britta, thank you for doing a fantastic job. Um, it has been a great webinar. Um, and um, I suggest that we all now go online and we be successful online and in Europe and be e-commerce enabled in Europe and manage our VAT correctly. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I am closing the webinar now.